We want to talk about soulmates. Soulmates, so very famous universal idea today, the notion of soulmates, but really it comes from the Torah because that's where we see it first brought right at the beginning. Chapter one is the creation of the world and the very next thing is Adam and Eve, which is the first pair of soulmates, the first couple. So we'll get right into it and see where that whole idea of soulmates actually comes from and talk about how that translates into marriage and all those interesting phenomena surrounding that. So we read in chapter 2 in Bereshit. So God says, Vayomer Hashem Elohim, lo ha'adam levado. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for a human being, for man to be alone. Eselo ezer kenegdo. So God says, I will make man a helper, ezer kenegdo, against him. And help, literally the translation is a helper against him, which is already a bizarre statement because it should have just said, Eselo ezer, I'll make for him a helper, a companion. But it says, Ezer kenegdo. There's like an extra word here which needs explanation as well. A helper against him or opposite him, literally. That's strange. And then we read how God put Adam to sleep. Vayapel Hashem Elohim tardema al haadam. He put him to sleep and... Adam slept, ve'ishan, ve'ikach achat mitzalotav, and then God took one of his, we have to define what a tzela is, it's famously, commonly translated as a rib, that God took one of his ribs, maybe it wasn't a rib, and if we have time, we'll also discuss that, what was it really. So God took one of his sides, literally it says, tzela is a side, so God took one of his sides, ve'izgor basar tachtena, and created a whole human around it. He turned that side into a woman, and he brought the woman to Adam, to man. And Adam said, this time, after having explored all the animals, all the other beings in the garden, and not finding companionship among them, uh, he said, this time, that this one is bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh, and lezoti kareisha, and I will call her Isha, the woman, kimi ish lukachazot, because she was taken from ish, she was taken from a man, so she is Isha, and that also needs explanation. What is the what is these terms? What does that mean? Because she was taken from an ish, she is an Isha. Uh, we have to explore those words as well, and then the famous words alken. Therefore, yazov ishet aviv etimo. Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother vedavak be ishto and to cleave onto, literally like to glue onto his spouse, and they should become one flesh again. So the meaning there is that Adam was this whole being made in the image of God, and then God kind of split him into two, took a side and split him. And then God says, well, now, therefore, you have to come back together again. You were one being, you were split into two beings, and now you have to become one being Again, reunite as basar echad. So you're like these soulmates. Almost literally, here it's literally saying you're body mates. You should be one flesh. But the implication is that you should reunite and become one again. And, and the chapter ends by just emphasizing that uh, and they were both naked. Adam and his wife, man and his wife. And they were not ashamed. So that also needs a little bit of explanation as well. What is really the meaning of that? And then the spiritual part is where we get in the Talmud already. Now the Talmud comments on this, not on this specifically, actually. Now the Talmud comes in and tells us the actual soulmate part. So in Masechet Sota, right at the beginning, on the first page of Masechet Sota, it says, Ein mezavgin lo le'adam isha. The first statement is that in heaven, they don't uh, match a person, uh, of a man to a woman. Ela lefima asav. It all depends on a person's own deeds. Uh, and Shanemar, how do we know? Because there's a verse that says, So that's, that's the proof text from the Tanakh is this verse. Basically that based on a man's deeds, the heavens match him up with a fitting soulmate. The match is made in heaven. And that this is a very famous statement that the Talmud says that making a zivug, that for the heavens to match a person, or in general, for a person to find his, his match, his soulmate, is as difficult as the splitting of the sea. That's the statement, that a person's, to find a person's soulmate, to find a person's match, is as difficult as splitting the sea.
And the Talmud follows up and asks a question on that. It says, well, is it really so difficult to find, is it so difficult to match for the heavens to find you a soulmate or to match you with a soulmate? Because we have another teaching, and the Talmud brings this other teaching, which says, that 40 days before the fetus is even conceived, before a child is conceived, 40 days before, already, a heavenly voice, it's decreed already in heaven that bat ploni le ploni, that the daughter of this person belongs to this person, bet ploni le ploni, and so on. So how? So how can it be? We have two teachings here. One teaching is that make, ma- making matches in heaven, matchmaking in heaven is as difficult as a splitting of the sea. Something great and miraculous. On the other hand, we have a very famous teaching that 40 days before a person's even conceived, they already have their soulmate decreed in heaven. So it seems like it's not so difficult for a person to get their soulmate. It's already been decreed from heaven that you find your soulmate. So how do we reconcile this? So Talmud says, Lo kashe, it's not a difficulty because one statement is referring to bezug rishon and the other bezug sheni. What does that mean? Your initial first soulmate is decreed from heaven 40 days before you were conceived before your soul even came down here or was even uh, set aside to come down to earth, it was already decreed that this person's soulmate is that person. But you can have a second soulmate. What if that soulmate, it doesn't work out? What if that match doesn't work out? Why would it not work out? As we discussed last time, because of free will. Because a person might make really terrible decisions and they will not find their soulmate or they will choose not to marry their soulmate. They, the God puts the soulmate in front of the person and the person just makes a bad decision and thinks this is not for me, makes the wrong decision, or whatever, moves countries because a person has free will and never meets their soulmate. So then the heavens have to arrange another soulmate for the person because of that free will problem. Or a, a couple might be soulmates and they, again, because of free will, they won't get along and then they'll get divorced. Okay, so now a person needs to find a new soulmate or a new partner. And that person, now to do the second match is already very difficult. That's like as difficult and miraculous as the splitting of the sea. And the Zohar really elaborates on this and says, it starts by saying, nafkin kechada nafkin. When the souls are basically formed and emerge, they emerge as both male and female. And then, when they are ready to come down into this world, and they split into two halves. And then it is God that brings them back together in this world, the two halves of these souls. That this, uh, this task, this responsibility of making matches, of bringing souls together, is the responsibility of God alone. So we know that God sometimes appoints various angels to do other things for him. He appoints emissaries, angels, but when it comes to this, when it comes to matchmaking, it's God by himself. He is responsible for this. And he is alone, the Ihu Yada Zivuga de Lehon. He alone knows who is supposed to match up with who. Zaka u Barnash, the Zache Beovdoi Vazil Beor Keshot, that a person who follows a divine path and you know, follows a Torah path and has good deeds, uh, like the Talmud really says, will merit to find their soulmate. So how do you find your soulmate? If you do God's will and you follow the proper divine path, then God will surely uh, bring your soulmate kind of close to you, will help you find your soulmate. Classic question, how do you find your soulmate? Everybody asks, how do I know if I married my soulmate? How do I find a soulmate? So the Zohar says, if you do God's will and you do what you're supposed to be doing, then surely you will merit to find your soulmate. But there, there's this problem of the free will issue. What if I'm doing what I'm doing but the other one isn't. It's not my fault. So then am I out of a soulmate? How do we deal with this problem? And we discussed this a little bit before, that really you have a whole hierarchy of potential soulmates. So again, in the heavens, they'll have to give you a second potential soulmate. If the first one doesn't work out, it's not fair for you because of somebody else's bad choices. So God then has to set you up with somebody else. And then you have a second soulmate. Not as good as the first one, but still good, still a soulmate. And what if the second one doesn't work out? Then you have to have a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and up to how many? 
how many possible soulmates might God set you up with? So the Mishnah in Masechet Sanhedrin said, you know, in the Torah, it says that a king, one of the mitzvot of the Torah, is that a king cannot have too many wives. You know, you've heard this? Lo yarbelo nashim. So it's in Parashat Shoftim. It says that a king cannot have too many wives. But the Torah doesn't say what's too many. How many is too many? So a king is allowed to have multiple wives for various reasons, including political ones, like King Solomon married to make various peace treaties. You know, back then it was common for a king to take a princess from, you know, they, they make peace treaty and they seal the deal with a marriage between the royal families. So a king's allowed to take on multiple wives. And, but how, how many is too many? Like the Torah doesn't say. So that's where you need this whole oral Torah. You need an oral tradition to come in and tell you how many. So the Mishnah says that the limit is 18. The Mishnah says that the limit for a king, how many wives can a king have? No more than 18. Okay, that's in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 21. And then the Gemara de- f- explains that. Like, where, do th- where did that Mishnah come from? How do we, where did they derive 18? Why 18? Why not more? And it's based on the wives of King David. So King David was the quintessential Jewish king. He is like the, the king. And so King David had 18 wives. So if King David had 18 wives, then that's the limit. That seems to be the simple understanding of the discussion. We have to go further there. But the simple understanding of that page is, well, King David had 18 wives. How do we know King David had 18 wives? Because again, the Tanakh does not say openly that he had 18 wives. There's a verse that says that named six of his wives that he had initially in Hebron. Because if you remember, he became king at age 30, and for the first seven years of his reign, he was not in Jerusalem yet, he was in Hebron. His first capital was Hebron, and then after seven years, he moved to Jerusalem. And while he was in Hebron, he had six wives. And the sages say that he had six, but there's also a blessing that he got that his wives will multiply, that he'll have more, everything that he has will be multiplied, kahena and kahena, like these and like these. So whatever he had would get tripled. So our sages derive from that. We know he took on more wives later when he was in Jerusalem, including Bathsheba. So how many wives did he have total? He had six, and he was blessed to have Kahena and Kahena, another double of what he already has, so, or triple what he currently has, so that means 18. There are different interpretations, but the consensus is that he had 18 wives. That's the pshat. That's a simple understanding. But the Arizal comes in and gives us the Kabbalistic meaning. The Kabbalistic meaning, the Arizal says, it's not that because King David had 18 wives, it's like that's what, that's not what he's saying. He's saying a person from heaven can have up to 18 soulmates. That's why King David had 18 wives. He was just very ambitious and married all 18 of them. Right? He found all 18 of his soulmates and happened to marry all of them, which for us would be forbidden. But for a King David, for a king, that would be allowed because he's allowed to have multiple wives. For us monogamous folks, you get one, you should, we, we should attempt to find our one soulmate. But the Arizal comes and says that basically King David married all 18 of his soulmates because a person can have up to 18 soulmates. And a king cannot have more than 18 because at that point it'll be solely for his own pleasure and not for the spiritual reason of finding your soulmate. So the Arizal says that King David married those 18 women because they were all his soulmates and he wanted for that spiritual rectification, whatever that that was required to fulfill there. Where do we go to exchange the one you have for the next one? Costco. Costco. They take back anything. <laughs> no, you don't exchange. You, you correct. You improve. You don't exchange. <clears throat> so that's it. So, okay, so we derive that number really on a simple level from King David who had 18 wives. And who was King David's number one soulmate? Bathsheba, because the Talmud says that Bathsheba was his soulmate. It was decreed not only 40 days before they were conceived, but regarding King David and Bathsheba, it says that was decreed from the start of creation. From before creation already, God decreed that David and Bathsheba are the perfect power couple. So that was his, his original first soulmate. So a person has 18 soulmates, and it's all based on, again, because of that free will. So a person's meant to be. You have one true soulmate that's like really much half of your soul. But if that doesn't work out, then God has to arrange a second one. If that doesn't work out, then a third one. So it seems very difficult. You have billions of people on the planet, and God has to make all these soulmates. So that's probably very time-consuming. And in fact, that's exactly what the Midrash says. 
the Midrash says that this is what God spends all of his time doing. Remember, this is not meant to be taken literally. But the Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah says that one woman, Matrona, Sha'alait Rabbi Yossi Bar Chalafta, a woman asked Rabbi Yossi, um, how long did it take God to create his universe? And he told her, of course, So he told her it took him six days. Right? We know that it takes six days that God created the world. Okay, so So what's God doing now? So he created the whole universe all the whenever, and it took him six days. So what's he doing since then? And he told her, God is sitting, and he told her, and is making matches. Yeah, that's all he spends all his day matchmaking because it's such a complicated thing, right? So he says, Bito shel ploni le ploni, ishto shel ploni le ploni, mamono shel ploni le ploni. He makes all kinds of matches, not only for wives, but also financially. Mamono shel ploni le ploni, how money should move around in economically. Um, you know, people make money, people lose money. And so God has to orchestrate all these things. Uh, but his main job is matchmaking. God's, uh, that's what the Midrash says. Again, it's not meant to be taken literally. Right? That's for yeah. everybody, right? Not only Jews. The Matrona is not even a Jewish woman. Matrona is usually referred to a Roman woman. Oh, asked, so, right. Okay. so when we think about God making Zivugim, um, it's just amazing how he has to bring people together if you actually stop and think about what it took to bring you and your spouse together. Now, we, we often don't think about all these things, but if you like put your, the, your history, go back in time and actually look into it, like what did God have to do, all these series of coincidences to bring two people together and find their soulmate. How does God match soulmates? We said that the Torah says, Ezel kenegdo, that, he, that God made a helper against him, okay, or opposite him. So, so the Zohar says something really interesting. It uses Yitzchak and Rivka as a model. Now, as a quick aside, why Yitzchak and Rivka specifically? Because, as we've discussed before, Yitzchak and Rivka are actually kind of like the perfect epitome, the epitome of a perfect marriage. You know, they represent the perfect marriage in the Torah. If you look at our forefathers, amongst all of them, Yitzchak and Rivka are really the only monogamous ones. The only completely monogamous ones, we know Avraham had at one point Hagar and Yaakov had four wives, but Yitzhak is the only one that was completely monogamous. And in fact, the first time that the word love between husband and wife is, a, in, is mentioned in the Torah is actually between Yitzhak and Rivka, that when Yitzhak married her, he took her and Beyahavea, and he loved her. So the first time, we know that the first time a word is mentioned in the Torah, that's where we find the true meaning of that word. And the first time the word love is used in the context of marriage between husband and wife, is specifically between Yitzhak and Rivka. So they represent the perfect love. Not only that, but the only instance in the Torah of an intimate act between a husband and wife is also only with regards to Yitzhak and Rivka. If you remember, we read that Yitzhak was metzachek et ishto, that he was almost like entertaining his wife. And Avimelech saw him somehow through the window or whatever it was, Avimelech saw it and said, how could you do this? Because he didn't know that they were husband and wife. So uh, the only instance of actual intimacy beyond reproduction in the Torah is also Yitzhak and Rivka. So they truly are the embodiment of a perfect marriage. And we see how perfect they were because their marriage was so powerful and they were such the, the true definition of soulmates coming together. In fact, if you like gematrias, if you like numerical numerology, if, if you go back to Bereshit, remember we said that God, God said that a man and a woman should come back to be basar echad. They have to reunite. Soulmates have to reunite to become one flesh, one body, to become totally holy one, basar echad. If you take the gematria of basar echad, Basar, Bet is 2, and Shin is 300, and Reish is 200, Basar is 502, Echad, Aleph is 1, and Chet is 8, and Dalet is 4, Echad is 13, Basar Echad is 515. And that's exactly the value of, if you take Yitzchak, Yud, Tzadi, Chet, Kuf is 208, Rivka, Reish, Bet, Kuf, He is 307, Yitzchak and Rivka is also 515. So Yitzchak and Rivka very much, like even math, with mathematical precision, fulfilled the command of soulmates becoming totally one, basar echad. The, the numerical value of Yitzchak and Rivka is basar echad. 
So they were that perfect marriage. And, and you see from Yitzchak and Rivka, actually, the amazing power of, of a perfect marriage because they were able to really change their own fate. They could not have children. And then, if you remember the Torah says that they prayed together, that Yitzchak and Rivka actually prayed together. And through their, that perfectly whole unified soul, they were able to actually change their fate and, have, and bring children into the world through that power of prayer which was only possible because they were such perfect soulmates. And there is a connection there between prayer and marriage. And one of the actual kind of sgulot, one of the ways to people sometimes wonder why they, their prayers aren't answered. And this is one of the places from which we learn that if you want your prayers to be answered, start by having a good relationship with your spouse. So when you have shlom bayit, when you have a real loving relationship with your spouse, that's when the gates open in the heavens and your prayers are a lot more likely to be answered. So we see that with Yitzhak and Rivka as well, that because they were such a perfect couple, they had their prayers answered instantly. So the Zohar uses Yitzhak and Rivka as a model specifically because they are such perfect soulmates. So we learn really everything about soulmates or most of what we learn from soulmates, we, we learn from, we derive from Yitzhak and Rivka. Yitzhak, we all know Yitzhak was the embodiment of Gvura, of Din. Right? His father, Avraham, we know was Chesed. Yeah? Very famous that Avraham was Chesed, Yitzhak was Gvura, Yaakov was Tiferet. All the forefathers had a particular quality, and Yitzhak's quality was Gvura, was restraint, strictness. You know, Yitzhak was very uh, introspective, was kind of contemplating on his own. He didn't really have students. Avraham would go out, he was very social, he gave classes, he hosted people for meals, and, you know, he had a tent with uh, many openings on each end so that people wouldn't have a hard time finding his door. He was always looking for people to host, and he was very social. So he was very chesed, he was very giving. He wanted to host people, he wanted to teach. He had many disciples, right? The Torah says he made many souls. But about Yitzhak, it doesn't say that. Yitzhak was very much a lone warrior. Uh, he didn't have many students, he didn't really host people. He wasn't that kind of person. He was more in his own little world. He was more with that quality of strictness, severity. So he's Gvura. But his father was Chesed. So the Zohar says that Yitzhak came from the side of Chesed, from his father, but he was Gvura. And Rivka is the exact opposite, because his wife, Rivka, she came from the side of Gvura. She came from a family of idol worshippers. She came from a very tough environment, from a place of impurity. But she was Chesed. Right? We see her when she is introduced in the Torah. She comes as this you know, comes to Eliezer and she wants to give him water and she even gives water to all his camels. Like she, that's a lot of work to pump water for his 10 camels and they can drink dozens, if not hundreds of liters at a time. So she had to, you know, do all this work, but she was happy to do it. So she was the embodiment of Chesed coming out of Gvura and Yitzhak was Gvura coming out of Chesed. So the Zohar says that God matched them together one against the other, because it's exact, that's the perfect match, that you want to have kind of opposites, that's nice. When you have opposites, two helping each other, that's where they can actually be each other's critics. And so in a marriage, it could be very frustrating, because in general, men and women think very differently. Right? But more than that, God matches up people to actually be different. They are an ezer kenegdo, and that's on purpose, because you don't want that kind of confirmation bias of two people thinking wrongly about everything. You actually want to have differences so that you can be each other's toughest critics. And the idea is not to be frustrated by those differences, but to actually appreciate that. And we're supposed to accept rebuke lovingly. We should want rebuke. We should want to improve ourselves. So a spouse really should be your toughest critic, and you should be grateful for that. And that's why the, the language of the Torah is that God made Adam and Eve ezer kenegdo, helpers against each other. Because that's when you really help. You've got to have some opposition. You know, otherwise, you're not necessarily going to help. So that's the idea. So God actually wants to bring together people with opposite qualities to complement each other. And they say that as well. When you look at, we said the words ish and isha, right? Adam said she is isha because she was taken out of an ish. And if you look at those words, our sages spend a lot of time talking about in different places about those words, Isha and Isha, because what do they have in common? Ish is spelled Aleph Yud Shin, and Isha is Aleph Shin He. So what do, which letters do they have in common? Aleph and Shin, which is Esh. What's in common between them is fire. So if they're too similar, if it's only they have everything in common, then it's a 
for, could be a problem because it could be too much fire there. That's not going to go well. But what do they have different? The Yud and the Hey, which is Yah is God, right? Yah is one of the names of God. Yud Hey, like Hallelujah. What does Hallelujah mean? Literally Hallelujah, yeah, right? Praise God. And that's what it means. People around the world, even non-Jews, sing Hallelujah, and many of them don't know what it means. But it literally means to praise God, right? Yud Hey is God. So when you focus on the differences and you appreciate the differences between men and women, that's where the godliness really is. That's where you complement each other. That's a big mistake that people today make in like modern day kind of feminism and so on, that men and women are obviously equal, but they make the mistake of thinking equal means being the same. And there's this push to somehow make women more masculine and make men more feminine. Um, it's kind of like the opposite. You know, we, we should actually appreciate our differences and, and highlight them and use them to help each when other. When you say women, do you mean birthing people? <laughs> I just mean women, yeah. In short, marriage is supposed to be a humbling experience, right? There has to be some opposition. Uh, your spouse is an ezel kenegdon. The help comes from being, a, being also opposite you. Now, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, one of the Midrashim, a very well-known Midrash, attributed to Rabbi Eliezer, uh, Rabbi Eliezer Agadol, who is one of the teachers of Rabbi Akiva. So, God, why did God want to... What does it mean that, like... God said it's not good for man to be alone. So the simple understanding of that is nobody wants to be alone. Men are humans, are social creatures. Nobody wants to be alone. But there's another reason for it that the, that the Midrash brings, which is, that originally Adam was like one, like an angel. He was whole. And Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God said, I'm one, God is one. And he's one. I'm one in my world, in my universe, and he's one in his world. God does not reproduce. And he doesn't reproduce. So that's a big problem because he is going to be like God on earth. Right? He's going to think of himself as a God. We need to make him a little, bring him down to earth a little bit. So God said, I'm going to split him in half. That's why Because if he's one, he's going to think of himself as a God on earth. And so that's why the, the idea of it's supposed to be a humbling experience so that you realize that you're not God and it's supposed to bring your ego down a little bit. That's kind of like the purpose of marriage. So God split man in half. There's, on that note, there's an idea here, which is about the ribs. When we talk about splitting man in half, so how did this creation actually take place? This is the big question. What, what does it mean that God took a tzela out of it? Was it a rib? the way it's classically translated, or was it, whatever that means, a side? What was it exactly? How did God make man? So there's really two, two kind of classic explanations. Either God made Adam male, then took, let's say, a rib or something else, and made a female out of it. So originally Adam was male, and then God made a female out of the male. Or was Adam originally both male and female? And then God split him in half and made a uh, male and female. You see the question? Yeah. Was man made, Adam made as a male, and then God made a female? Or, or he was made androgynous, and then God split him into male and female halves? Except they don't, you wouldn't reproduce. Exactly. So based on this Midrash, it seems like Adam was, he was in God's image. God is not male or female. God is neither male or female. Doesn't reproduce. Adam was made in God's image, neither male or female, without reproduction. So it seems like Adam was without a gender. And then gender was created. You see the question? How was it really? Was gender created right from the beginning and Adam was male? Is there a point to have a male if there's no female? You see the problem? So was Adam made as a male and then a female was made out of him? Or was he made without, with nothing and then God split the original Adam into male and female halves? So they're kind of both valid approaches. The, simplest, the simple understanding, the pshat, seems to be that God made Adam male and then took a rib out of him and then made from that rib a female. Okay. And based on this understanding, actually, our sages say that, therefore, it's man's responsibility to find a, a, his wife. 
that the obligation to get married is specifically on the man, that it's a man's job to find the woman and not the other way. Be, why? Because when a person loses something, it's the person who lost something that has to go and look for it. So since Adam lost a rib, he has to go and find. Since Adam lost something, he's the one that has to go and find what he lost. The woman never lost anything. And she was made out of Adam. So that's what our sages say, that since Adam is the one that lost, he, it's, the responsibility is on him to find what he lost. And that's why traditionally, until recently, it was always the man's job to court a woman and to find a woman and to, it was his responsibility. So why a rib? The Sforno says, why did he have to just take a rib? He already made man and he only needed a little bit of Adam. He only needed a little sample of Adam to make woman. So he took only he only needed a little bit of Adam. And what's that? Achat mitzalotav. He only needed a sample of his DNA, basically. And so he only took a rib, a small part. And that's really amazing. When you, if you read this kind of like scientifically, that Torah says that God put Adam to sleep and then removed something out of him and built around it a female. Think about that as like in a science fiction kind of way. It's very much like what we can even do today. Like you, we have today machines that can, we've already started, scientists have already started organ printing. We have the capabilities to print basic heart cells, liver cells, and it's getting better and better. Get to the point where you can clone. You only need some stem cells, right? With a person's stem cells, you can build potentially when the technology gets there, and we will eventually, build whole organs. And by t- they're already doing it. They can already print liver, heart cells. Um, so you only need some stem cells. Now, what's amazing here is where do we get stem cells? You can, the best ones come from fetuses, yeah, but that's kind of unethical. So there's another way to do it, which is we get it from, from bone marrow, right? You can, you can do a bone marrow transplant for a person who needs it, right? So they, sometimes they do bone marrow transplant. So bone marrow has stem cells as well. So now when you think about it, when you think about the rib, that God had to take a rib, God had to specifically take a bone, an etzem, out of Adam, and more than that, I heard this years ago. Medically, like they usually used to take, in the old days, stem cells from the femur bone, from your leg bone, because it's a nice thick bone. The problem is that you have to go through a lot of muscle to get there. So it's very painful and it takes time to recover. So they used to go to the femur. Now what you can do is they can actually go straight to the rib because the rib doesn't have much meat around it. So it's actually much easier to access stem cells from your bones, from your rib bones, than from your femur. And so the technology today is a lot better that you don't have to go to the femur, you can do it more precisely with the rib. That's the easiest bone to really access. Right? And there's not much meat around it. So anyway, so today, like even today medically, it's, it's a lot easier to actually derive stem cells if you need a little sample of stem cells from rib bones. So imagine what God did. Put Adam to sleep, took some DNA, and, and really Adam didn't lose a rib. Because he like that's a classic question too. Does do we have less ribs than what Adam had? It says he only took achat mitzalotav. So like, does one side of your body have one less rib than the other? No. So God took a sample from one of his ribs. So it's like it seems like something really medically accurate and scientifically accurate that God took a sample of stem cells from one of his ribs and then built from that a new human being, like he organ printed Eve. It almost sounds blasphemous to say it, but it's interesting that you can, you know, that, that idea that very similar to how if we were to do it one day with our, with our like advanced biotechnology, we'd probably do something similar. Take some stem cells from a rib and reverse engineer them and uh, play around with the chromosomes and organ print, uh, you know, a new human or something or clone. So it's very interesting. So th- there's one idea that it's a rib, but then there's another from a more midrash level, which we've probably all heard, that it says, that God made man in his image. And Amar Rabbi Yirmiya ben Elazar, Beshar Shabara Kadosh Baruchu et Adam Arishon, Androgynous Barao. He made him androgynous. And our sages actually use the term androgynous, androgynous. It's in the midrash, in Bereshit Rabbah. 
uh, because the Greek term, the Greeks coined that term. The rabbi, we, there's no Jewish Hebrew Torah term for a person who's both male and female, but the Greeks coined the term androgynous, which literally means man, woman, right? Uh, andros and gyno, like a gynecologist, although the G is more silent. And when you say it in Greek, they don't, it's actually, it's a proper gimel, uh, which is actually without a dagesh, which is not a hard gimel. Anyway, that's a more linguistic debate. But uh, androgynous in, in Greek literally means man-woman. Because the reality is that it's rare, but it does happen that a child can be born a hermaphrodite. That there could be a child with uh, ambiguous uh, genitals or, you know, so the, the, the sages are aware of that because it's a reality that existed. Um, and actually, it ties into something really, the, one of the dumbest anti-Semitic things I ever heard. Somebody once <laughs> heard somebody say that, that, like, it's this whole thing today of, um, like, hermaphrodites and transgender, and it must be like a Jewish conspiracy. It's a Talmudic conspiracy, that the Talmud invented this, and it doesn't exist, and it's, a, it's one of these, like, ridiculous anti-Semitic, one of the most ridiculous anti-Semitic conspiracies that I ever heard. And somebody was actually trying to convince me that the Talmud invented this idea. So the Talmud did not invent it. It's a biological fact that there are these things, that people can be born with these Thing. I'm not like, we're not talking about transgenderism and a person who wants to switch to gender. That's different. I'm talking about a child that is born androgynous. It happens, right? It happened 2,000 years ago. The sages had to deal with that, right? So, uh, you know, it's the first Mishnah in Masachet Chagiga uh, is, starts by saying I, that Masachet Chagiga is about the holidays, about the pilgrimage festivals. You know that the Torah says that a Jew has to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem on the three pilgrimage festivals three times a year, Shalosh Regalim, on Pesach, on Shavuot, and on Sukkot. So the Torah says that Kol Zechurecha, all the males are obligated to go. The obligation was for all the men to journey to Jerusalem three times a year. And the first Mishnah in Masachet Chagiga says, but there is except akol chayavin, everybody is obligated to go, except, and it gives a dozen exceptions of who doesn't have to. And among those 12 is somebody who's androgynous. Why? Uh, be- again, people like that did exist. It was very rare, but they existed. So the sages had to deal with that. Is somebody androgynous considered male or female? They didn't know. So since he's not 100% male, and the Torah says, kol zechurecha, all your males have to go. So they exempted that person. The androgynous person, and that, that word androgynous, again, is used, a, that kind of person is exempt from going to Jerusalem. That doesn't mean they're not allowed to. That means if they want to, they can, but they're not obligated to. And, and also women were exempt because the Torah says all the males have to come. That doesn't mean that women were forbidden to go. They did go. We know they went. There was an Nizrat Nashim. There was a special place just for the women. So, but they weren't obligated to go. Same thing with a person who, let's say, was in a cast. Let's say a person broke his, God, God forbid, broke their leg and was in a cast right before Pesach. Was that person obligated to go to Jerusalem? No, because right now he is unable to go to make the pilgrimage, so he's exempt. And the sages say that the holidays, those pilgrimage festivals are called shalosh regalim, literally means legs. Like you had to be able to go physically on your own legs to Jerusalem. And if you couldn't physically go on your own legs, then you're exempt. So the Torah gives these rules because they had to deal with real practical realities. And so that's why the term androgynous existed back then. It's not because the Talmud invented it, which is ridiculous. It's not even a Jewish word. It's a Greek word. So the Talmud is just using a Greek word because there was no Hebrew word for it. Um, but anyway, that's the whole idea. It, th- there is this idea of Ad- Adam. Was Adam originally made androgynous? And then God split him in half. That's how it can do be. And the, the verse to prove it is because there's a verse in Bereshit that says, Zacharu nekeva bar'am. As if God made Adam originally both male and female. And Amar Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachman, B'sha'ah she'bara kadosh baruchu et Adam arishon, Dio partzufim bara'o. So there's even another opinion that perhaps he made him with two faces, that Adam was originally had a male and female face, and then he split Adam, that they, these faces were back to back, and God split Adam into a male and female half. Again, this is a midrash. It's not necessarily, it's not supposed to be taken literally. Uh, I think it's all supposed to just highlight the idea that a husband and wife are soulmates, that they're literally like one. They should see each other as if they're one back to back human being. And really, when you think about marriage, if you see your spouse as being you, then a lot of the problems that people often experience in marriage melt away. Because just like you 
love yourself and you would do anything for yourself and you forgive yourself all the time. And if you want something, you know, if you suddenly have a craving for ice cream, you'll probably get in your car and drive and get yourself the ice cream. So if your spouse suddenly has a craving for ice cream, then in the same way, you should get up and get in your car and go get them their ice cream because it's, you should think of them as you. And, and the, a request that, they, that your spouse makes is like your own request that your head that you that pops into your head. So if you see each other as really one person, then a lot of the issues in marriage go away. You have to take away that ego and not think so much about yourself and remember that you're actually one half. <clears throat> Rashi comments that Adam, when it says mitzalotav, it means from one of his sides, misitrav. Uh, just like I mentioned earlier, the Torah says tzela hamishkan, like a wall, a side of the mishkan. So it doesn't literally necessarily mean ribs. It can just mean that he made two halves. That's, and that's why they said, Rashi says, that Adam was really made both male and female. And then God split them in half. Although in Masachet Eruvin, there is kind of a middle opinion. So one opinion is that perhaps he had two faces, two sides, like we just saw. Uh, and there's a verse in Tehilim to prove it, Achor vekedem tzartani, that God made me forward and backwards. What does that mean that God made me? Achor vekedem tzartani, as if originally I was made forward and backwards. Originally I was made whole and I had a face both from the front and from the back. Chad amar partzuf vechad amar zanav. There's another opinion. He says, no, no, no. It wasn't a rib and it wasn't a face and it wasn't a side. He says, God took, Adam had a tail. And God took the tail and turned it into another human. This sounds crazy at first, but it makes sense in this because human beings, animals have tails. Human beings don't have tails. Now, we do have the structure in our vertebrae for a tail. And occasionally, children are born with tails. It does happen. It can happen. You can look up pictures online that there can be children born with tails. So the fact that we don't have a tail, and again, why does Shmuel say this? Why does Shmuel say that it was enough? Because, again, this is a reality that existed. Sometimes children are born with tails. Human beings don't have tails. So that's why Shmuel has this idea, and it's a really good one. It sounds weird at first, but it must be, or it seems like, maybe Adam did have a tail. God removed the tail. That's why, God no, that's why Adam no longer, man no longer has a tail. And then from the tail, which would also have bones, which would also have stem cells, no, no issue there. That could be a tzela too, that God made from the tail. Uh, the female, okay? That's possible too. So. It seems weird. It seems weird. But these are all different opinions of what does tzela mean. So is tzela a rib? Is it a tail? Or is it that a side that God literally split man in half and made male and female? So you have like these kind of three opinions. And the idea that uh, Adam was androgynous and maybe split in half actually has biologically has some merit because, for instance, we... Even when a, a male develops in the womb, the X chromosome kicks in first, and the X chromosome is what makes a female. And only later the Y chromosome kicks in and makes that baby a male. That's why also men have nipples, which are functionless. So it's kind of like a remnant of starting with the X, and then the Y kicks in and then turns that fetus into so there are people who have for example turner syndrome turner syndrome is a person who is missing one chromosome has 45 chromosomes instead of 46 so a male is xy a female is xx a person with turner syndrome has only one x the, is that person a male or female so a male is um, you have you have a total of 46 chromosomes you get 23 from your father 23 from your mother one of those is the sex chromosome. So a man would always get a Y chromosome from his father. A woman always gives her X chromosomes to her children. So a female is XX, so she got an X from her mom and an X from her dad. A male is XY, he got an X from his mom and Y from his dad. Now occasionally, you can have a, basically a non-disjunction disorder. Down syndrome is the most famous, most well-known, but there are others. So one is called Turner syndrome, where a person only inherits <clears throat> one X. And there's no other X or Y. So is so that's my question to you. A person with Turner syndrome who has only one X, do they become female or male or neither? How do they look? They, they become look? female. A person with Turner syndrome is still female because they still have an X. X by default makes you female. If you add a Y, you become a male. But probably you have 
Where do the, the, the genitals show? Right. Female. Oh, so X is female. Yeah, yeah. A ter- person with Turner syndrome is female. They have, they, might, they will be infertile. They will have some perhaps developmental issues, but they are female. Now, you can also have Klinefelter syndrome, which is XXY. You have two X's plus a Y. So what's that? That's an extra chromosome. That's a person with a 47th chromosome. So is that person going to be male or female? Feminine. Yes, going to be male because you have the Y, but can have more f- secondary female sex characteristics, can have more. Yes, you can. There's XYY syndrome, and there's triple XY, and there's triple X. There's a triple X syndrome. The fact that, that the Y kicks in after, that means the, the woman base the male base. That's right, exactly. So, so when you say that's why, that's a, a point for the androgynous side because it seems to imply that man was originally not male, right? right. So the idea that man was male and then a rib or a tail or whatever was taken out and a female was made seems to contradict a little bit what we know from embryology and genetics, which is that we all kind of start off with the X starts off first, then the Y kicks in. And without the Y, you are by default a female. I'm just, that's a point for the androgynous side, that's what I'm saying. So I guess we have to go with the Midrash that perhaps, meaning not male, that Adam Rishon was originally not male. And then God split into male and female. Okay, let's conclude. So going back to the whole thing of, of marriage, the Mishnah in Yoma says that when the Torah says that the, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, he has to atone for the people. On Yom Kippur, he atones for everybody. And the Torah says that he atones for himself also. He atones for himself. And for his household. For his house. What does that mean for his household? Who is his household? Like the Kohen Gadot atones for all of us. Like he's the facilitator of atonement. And he atones for himself on Yom Kippur in the ancient times in the temple. And for his house. So the Mishnah says in Masachet Yoma that Beito zu ishto, zo ishto. That his house, who's a, who's a man's house? A man's house is his wife. Yeah. And so that's actually the interplay of the word. The word for a girl in Hebrew is a but, which is the same as a bite, as a house. That there's this connection there between the woman and the house. So the house is for the woman. A man's house is his wife. That's, that's the idea. If we, we learn from that, that the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, had to be married. The person who was facilitating the atonement by law had to be married. And if his wife, let's say, God forbid, passed away right before Yom Kippur, he had to get married right before Yom Kippur because he could not be single. Oh. Yeah, he had to be married. The Kohen Gadol had to be married. It's a, it's a beautiful little thing there just to, for a man to realize that what is a man, like a man's home is wherever his wife is. That's the idea. And that's, that's a very kind of powerful, under, like, just to, to grasp that. In Masachet Yevamot, it says, Rabbi Chia v'akametzare. So Rabbi Chia had a really terrible wife. Terrible, terrible wife. She tortured him all the time. Amar Rav, basically, people asked him and said, even his own son basically said, why don't you just divorce her already? Right? Amar Rav? Yeah. So, so why don't you just divorce her already? Mm-hmm. And Rabbi Chia was, very, was seemingly very happy with her, even though she tortured him. And he said, Dayenu, it's enough. Shemegadlot banenu. It's enough that our wives raise our children and that they save us from sin, meaning for a man, they save us from sexual sin. That a man who's married, like, has a place to, to take care of whatever, his urges. So, so he wasn't that miserable. He wasn't that miserable, but he had, the, I mean, he had that. So he said, Dayenu, it's enough that they give us children and they raise our children for us. So it's enough that they do that and they save us from sin. As our sages say, that like a man who has a wife has his pat besal, that he has bread in his basket always, that he doesn't have to go and look for attraction out there because he, he has a wife. He has a, a place to be intimate with somebody. So that's what Rabbi Chia said. So it's also important to kind of reflect on that. Some men get married with the understanding that they're getting a maid that who's going to take care of them and do everything for them. But really, that's not the purpose of a wife, right? So Rabbi Chia said that it's enough that they give us children, which is already an amazing, miraculous thing. The fact that women have to go through childbirth is already, we all have kids, so we all know that's an incredible experience in itself and so taxing on, on a woman's body and... 
Um, and I mentioned this before, that scientists today found that a woman basically has the DNA of her children in her brain. Because when they, the children develop in her womb, the, the DNA of the baby basically gets into the bloodstream and gets into the... They found DNA of children in mother's brains. Like, the connection is that to that level. The women give over so much of their bodies. And it, so it's enough that they produce the children and go through all that whole struggle and, and raise the children, especially when they're small, like take care of them when they're little. And uh, that they save us. That was Rabbi Chia. That's why I'm not going to divorce her. Like that's everything I need. That's all really I need from her. And everything else is, is secondary. No, the first part was The first part is it's it's already a huge thing that they give us children. And then the second thing and also it's a source of of intimacy. Uh, so that's one. There's even there's another statement that really says. Like ultimately, Ainisha Ella Leyofi, that you get married for beauty. Like women are for beauty. Meaning a man shouldn't really expect anything from his wife because he gets married because a woman beautifies a man's life. That's all. Like you should just appreciate that. Yeah. So you don't read it the other way around. You can read it get married because she's beautiful. Yeah. She yeah. Exactly. That should be enough. That you get nachat from your wife, from seeing your wife. Having said that, having said that. In Masachet Ketubot, there's a famous question. What does a woman owe her husband? And it says she has to be mechabeset v'tochenet, and she has to do laundry, and she has to cook, and she has to do... But, but, the same place in Masachet Ketubot says that, like, she doesn't have to do those things for you, and you actually can outsource that labor. If you bring a maid, then she doesn't have to do these things for you. The maid can do it. So it's not like... It's, the idea is that somebody has to do the work. Like, there are chores to be done. So... Our sages discuss who is obligated for what, right? Like the, the Ketubah says what a man is obligated to do for his wife. He has to make sure she's fed and clothed and protected and whatever. So there's responsibilities that a man has and there's responsibilities that a woman has. Because things have to be done. Like if nobody does anything, then the whole household falls apart. So that's why in Masachat Ketubot it says that like these are the things that, these are the responsibilities that are more, that we assume a woman does. These are the responsibilities that we assume a man does. By default, they're just, the sages are saying, like, what is the default position? Women do these things, men do these things. And, but does it have to be? This? No. The responsibilities have to be taken care of by somebody. And whatever a husband and wife want to decide amongst themselves who does what, that's their business, as long as they're happy with that, right? Some men like to cook, some women don't, so it's fine. If he wants to cook, why not? He can cook. She doesn't have to. But she should do something else. That same place in Ketubot says that if a man basically relieves his wife of all work and she has nothing to do, the sages say there, you know, it's better that you just divorce her now because nothing good is going to come out of it if your wife is idle because idleness just leads to all kinds of stupidity, right? A person has to be busy. Like a person has to have a purpose. They have to be doing something. So when you have like this whole idea of, I don't know what to call it, desperate housewives that like their husbands work and they have maids and nannies and they don't have to do anything and everything's automated and today... You know, it's too easy, and then what? Right? And the same would be true for a man. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. A person who has no obligations, no responsibilities, no chores, no reason, like no meaning, nothing. What's, what is that going to lead to? So a lot of spending and a lot of s- stupid behavior. That's the, so that's why the sages famously say over there that, yes, you know, a woman can do all these things. She doesn't have to. You can outsource the labor to others. But if you're going to leave her with nothing to do, then you might as well just divorce her now because... Did you say that? Yeah, it's in Masachat Ketubot, like, right? Okay, let's finish. So, to conclude, there's, in that same place in Yevamot, there's another discussion of a father and son. Rav Yehuda le Rav Yitzhak. Rav Yehuda and his son, Rav Yitzhak. So, Rav Yehuda said, Ein adam korat ruach, ela rishona. That a person really only gets... Uh, true pleasure from their first love, from their first wife. I mean, hopefully they only have one wife, but how do we know? Because the Torah says, the Tanakh says, that you should be happy with the woman of your youth, meaning like your first love. There's nothing like your first love that's going to be your best love. That's what he's saying. And his son asked him, so like who? Like, give me an example. And he said, like your mom, like me and your mom. Like, obviously, who's like the best couple me and your mom are the best couple. And he says, like, really? You guys are, like, terrible as a couple. <laughs> and he says, yeah, your, your mother can be difficult, but she... Who, 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 is the, who is the couple 
Rav Yehuda and his wife. So Rav Yehuda is telling his son, Rav Yitzchak, that the best couple would be the first love. First marriage, first love, that's the best. It's really a lacha there. Obviously, a person should not have any relationships, any intimate relationships, uh, relationships until they get married. Uh, that should be your first and only love. It's, we, we preach really true monogamy. And so Rav Yehuda told that to his son. He says that you should have one wife, one woman, find one, marry her. That's the best. So then when his son asked him, like, who? Give me an example. He said, well, me and your mom, obviously. Like, we're the best. And he says, but you get, seriously, you guys are like a terrible couple. Uh, and he says, no, but yes, your mom's difficult. But he said, she is pacified very easily with a few nice words. As the old saying goes that, you know, you can fix up most problems in a marriage with uh, a three, with two, one of two three word formulas, right? You either say, I'm sorry, or you say, I love you, right? Those, those are the three, you have two formulas of three words that really usually fix a lot of problems. And that's what King Solomon said. In his wisdom, King Solomon was the wisest of all men. And he said in Mishle, in Proverbs, kol ahava, that love covers up all trans- transgressions. That ultimately, if you have true love, then um, you're going to be able to overcome everything. And so we'll end with this, with Isha Nisha. Remember we said the words Isha Nisha. What they have in common is Esh. What they have separate is God's name, Yud Hey. What this really means is what do you really need? You need to have two things to make a relationship work. You need to have two things. Esh. Esh, you have to have fire. You have to have passion. You have to have romance. You have to. You have to keep that flame burning. Right? It has, the intimacy is super important. It can't be allowed to die down. Right? And that's one of the nice things about something like the laws that we have about Nida, of men and women having a time to separate from each other so that they have time to want each other again. And there are other ways to keep that flame going, whatever it is that you need to do, a date night, uh, going out, whatever it is, go on a vacation. And whatever needs to be done to keep that flame burning, you need the esh, and, but then you also need the yud hey, right? A, a relationship has to have God in it. It has to be. A proper marriage needs the spiritual foundation. A husband and wife have to recognize that they're soulmates. And if there is no recognition of that, the marriage will be very, very difficult. If you look at statistically in, the, in recent history, as the world becomes more and more secular, and moves away from God, divorce rates move up, 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 and marriage rates drop. Actually, marriage rates have been declining very steadily over the years. People are not getting married because they don't see a reason to. When, when society teaches you that you're just an animal, when you go to public school and all you learn about is that you're just a glorified chimpanzee and you've just evolved here and there's no meaning to it. So, well, if I'm just a mammal, then why can't I be like a chimp or like a lion or a gorilla that's an alpha male with many with many females and you know, no, there's no monogamy. If I'm a mammal, then why should I just, why should I commit myself to one marriage? It makes sense. So society is teaching people to basically be animals when it comes to sexual things and uh, teaching people to be a sexual deviants instead of what it should be really. So that's the problem. So we, we see that as society gets more, less godly, marriages break down, there's less people getting married, more dissatisfaction, because at the root of a relationship is God. The only reason that there is marriage is because the Torah says so. Because if it's not for that, then we're just animals, right? If you take God and soul out of it, then you really are just a mammal. You are just a glorified chimp. And there's no reason to be married. It seems totally crazy. When you take God out of the equation, marriage is totally irrational. Why would I lock myself up with one person for the rest of my life? It seems totally irrational, and it's against our biological nature, especially for a man. It's totally against a man's biology to do that. And again, look at our closest cousins in the animal world, right? So if you take God and soul out of it, there's no point to it. And that's why without God, in a godless society... Marriages are failing like crazy. So you have to have Esh and you have to have Yud Hey. You have to have God in it. That's really the key to the perfect relationship. Is as long as you focus on having both. There has to be godliness. There has to be a recognition that we're soulmates. And there has to be actually doing God's will. Right? It, both have to understand that there has to be some kind of spiritual guide. We have a Torah. We do mitzvot. We are responsible to do certain things. 
focus on the chesed and on fulfillment of Torah and, and so on. So God has to be at the center of the relationship and the fire has to be there, the passion, the love. That's the key. So question, yeah. so every marriage supposedly is supposed to happen? What do you mean? Like you said, because you said, okay, you need to try to make it work. Maybe it wasn't meant to work. Yeah, that's why we have a mitzvah to get divorced. Right? Okay. Divorced is allowed in Judaism. It's, what, it's a commandment. Like if, if a marriage is not working out, you're not supposed to suffer. But there has to be a good reason for it. There's a lot more to say, but I think we can sum it up with that. That uh, you know, the, the key is, or one of the keys, or two of the keys, is to have the fire, the esh, and the yud hey. That's really one of the secrets of the relationship between ish and isha. So have the flame and have God in the relationship. And uh, hopefully you can have, uh, really, to recreate Adam and Eve, because the, the whole idea of Adam and Eve, why does the Torah really start with Adam and Eve? Why do we need all this stuff about all these other people that doesn't have a direct connection to Judaism anyways? So, but the Torah specifically begins with Adam and Eve, that they were the whole world. Adam and Eve were the world. And the idea there is, if you have a perfect relationship between a husband and wife, a good, a loving relationship, then that's a perfect world. And if you don't have one, that's a destroyed world. Like, within that one couple... Like, one couple is the world. That's kind of like the message there. That your world is your relationship with your spouse. And if you can have a proper loving relationship, that's your Garden of Eden. That will be a source of total comfort and pleasure. And if you don't have it, then that will be a Gehenom. And amazingly, even the Gimatria, if you like math, the Gimatria of Gan Eden and the Gimatria of Gehenom, which is really Gay Ben Hinom, the, the full word, is the same. It's the same numerical value. It's one of the beautiful gematrias. Why is the gematria of heaven and hell the same? Because ultimately, like, it's in your hands. You can make a heaven and hell on earth. And both of these places are on earth, right? The Garden of Eden was here on earth. And so was Gehenom. Gehenom is a valley outside the old city walls of Jerusalem. You can go there and take a walk there today if you want. So all, both of these places are actually names for places on earth. So you can create your own heaven and hell here on earth in the context of your relationship with your spouse. Because if that marriage is not healthy, it's going to feel like hell on earth. And if that marriage is healthy, then it'll feel like heaven on earth. And I think going back to Adam and Eve, I think that's really the secret message there, that if you can make that perfect, loving, passionate, godly, monogamous, healthy, kosher relationship, then you will have your Gan Eden, you will have the Garden of Eden on earth. So we'll end with that.